I'm so excited to welcome my friend Terry Pillow, the stylish Southern gentleman with the long silver hair. Terry is the former CEO of Tommy Bahama and through his passion and dedication for style, rose to work with some of the most well-regarded luxury designers in the world. Terry is now putting his passion and energy into his latest venture, Homer, a luxury brand that pays homage to his heritage and the art of fine leather. You're listening to another episode of Living in Santa Barbara. I'm your host, Kathy Henry. Now let's meet the very kind and gentle Terry Pillow. Terry and I met, I think we've known each other just about five years, maybe a little bit more. Maybe a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. And we met through the kids. Yeah. And we've had a lot of adventures together. Absolutely. Such as... Hopefully many more. <laughs> And COVID too. Remember, we had that oh, little adventure right. through COVID. Yeah. I have tried to forget it, but uh... yeah. Well, it started with uh, I invited Sam and Kelly to the desert. That's right. During right after COVID, you and left then me here by myself. And then I found out that I had COVID. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then she was afraid to come back. Yeah. Remember that? And then we had the Into the Woods performance, which you had in the backyard. Yeah, lots of fun. Yeah. Maybe the best one, uh, Into the Woods, where we did it on our lawn, was one of the best. Yeah, that was fun. that Sam was in and Maddox. Mm -hmm. So, And then I got to know you. I've been really impressed because I, I like the way you treat people mm -hmm. and uh, your humble Southern charm. I'm a Southerner and I've never forgotten that I'm a Southerner. And I guess uh, with that comes a, a lot of mannerisms and, that you learn early in, in your life. Yeah. That, uh, so uh, Arkansas wasn't exactly a breeding ground for the fashion business, but somehow I stumbled into it. Yeah, so tell us about that. So you were born and raised in Arkansas? Born and raised in Arkansas in a small little farming community of about 2,000 people. And uh, it was uh, not an obvious career choice to be in the fashion business. But uh, early on, I don't know why, and everybody, my family tries to figure out why I got in the involved in the fashion but, but from an early age I basically was concerned with style more than we didn't have access to fashion there weren't a lot of stores and where you could buy things so how you put it together and how you I, my mother tells the story that uh, she used to have to stay up all night and iron my jeans because I wanted them a certain crease and iron all my shirts because I wanted them to be fresh and so from an early age, I understood that you, know, you could put the thing, you could di differentiate yourself with style versus fashion. At what age was that? I was thinking probably in the seventh grade when uh, I started. So that's when you're 13 years old. And you, I started realizing that you could you know, make yourself stand out in different ways with how you wore things versus what you wore. And from, from there, I just kept, you know, thinking about and looking at fashion. And uh, when I went to college, I kept following that same path and went to work at a little men's store in college and loved every minute of it. Never took more than 10 hours of credits and went to school for five years and worked 40 hours a week in that men's store and just loved every minute of it. And what were you studying? Pardon me? What were you studying in college? Marketing and sociology. But at li literally, college, went to a small school in Arkansas. My college was really that men's store. I mean, I learned more about traditional clothing and clothing in general. That, uh, that that was kind of the education. And then when I graduated from college, I knew I couldn't stay there in that little men's store. There wasn't enough business for us all to make a living. So I went to Dallas, Texas, and started interviewing. And I camped out at Neiman Marcus until they agreed to give me a job. So you started as a salesperson? You know, it's funny. I, that's when I went down there to interview. I would take anything. I would have swept the floors if they would have given me a job. But uh, I kind of made a wrong turn. I walked in the sales floor and I said, where's the HR department? And they said, go up on the ninth floor and take a right. And I went up on the ninth floor and took a left to executive training. <laughs> so and it was about five o'clock in the afternoon. I'll never forget. And the guy said, can I help you? And I, I said, yeah, I need a job. <laughs> and he said, sit down here and, and, and talk to me for about 10 or 15 minutes. He said, can you come back in the morning? And I said, sure. And I came back in the morning. And he had eight interviews set up for me. And I thought, boy, this is a hard place to get a job. So <laughs> <That's tough. laughs> it's close. But at the end of that day, he offered me a position in the executive training class, which I had no idea then what how important that was. But 
it was a launching pad for everything that came. I was sometimes you get smart and sometimes you get lucky, and I think I got lucky. And Mr. Stanley Marcus taught our uh, training program, and uh, when uh, there was basically six months of classroom instruction, uh, retail math, and really taught you how to how to be an executive. And wow, that's amazing. It was amazing. It was a heck, hell of an opportunity for me. And then, uh, then you got rotated through buying offices, and then they sent you out to a store, the department manager, and they luckily they sent me to Newport Beach, California. Oh, well, that's not bad. <laughs> not, not, not a bad gig. And when I was 20, I guess 21 years old, and spent a year in Newport Beach, and I wanted to get back to Dallas as a buyer. And so in a year, they made me a buyer of sportswear and mm-hmm. moved back to Dallas. So Neiman's, I guess, is probably the most important you know, thing that really took a hobby and a, a interest and put it into a, an actual situation where I could have a career and follow the career in it. So after Neiman Marcus, how did you transition? What what came next? So you were doing well at Neiman. And- I was a buyer for about five years, six years, and basically I just wanted to stay a buyer, but that, that wasn't in the, 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 the trajectory and how to move along in these businesses. They, Neiman Marcus had an office in New York, and they uh, had a corporate product development office, and they needed somebody to run it from a men's point of view. So they relocated me to New York, which... It was a, a big deal. I'd been traveling to New York as a buyer for some time, and I was you know, familiar with New York, but I never thought I'd actually move to New York. And, and so when we moved to New York and started this corporate product development, and one day I was walking across the street after about four or five months and ran into a friend of mine, Alexander Julian, who I basically bought his line when uh, when I was a buyer, and he was a very talented designer, maybe probably one of the most, of all the names you mentioned that I've worked for, one of the intrinsically talented designers I ever worked with. And he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm doing corporate product development. He said, no, you're going to come to work for me. We're going to start a thing called Colors by Alexander Julian. And Colors, what was that? Colors by Alexander Julian, oh. which was a... We lit it up like a bottle rocket. I mean, that thing came off and uh, it was so successful. And we did that for a couple of years. And then I, I started getting calls from, uh, I, I'd also bought Ralph Lauren when I was a buyer. And mm-hmm. I got a call from Ralph Lauren saying that they were going to start this chaps business and wanted to know if I would be interested in coming over and working with Ralph to develop the chaps business. And at that point, Ralph Lauren was as big as it got. And yeah. they were so flattered. And I went over and talked to him, spent some time together. And needless to say, I took the job and uh, had a very good experience there. And then when when I was at chaps, I got, I got a call from an office of, what, what do you call them? Anyway, but Armani? No, I got a call from a, not a headhunter. A but recruiter. A recruiter. Yeah. But they, they were asking me questions about the gene business, and they wouldn't divulge who their client was. And basically, uh, come to find out after about six months of answering these questions, she said, well, I'm going to divulge my clients, George Armani, who'd like to meet you. And I, I mean, those two are the most iconic fashion designers that I can ever think of. Yeah. You know, very classy styles. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And and that time, this was probably 1988, 89. You didn't get any bigger than George Armani. Yeah. yeah. It was, he was a, and come to find out he was going to start this line called AX Armani Exchange, which uh, he just had the, the idea. He didn't know what it was that he wanted to do. And so getting involved in that on the, on the early stages was really fascinating. That was, you know, that was one of my favorite designers and one of my favorite brands back in the 80s. It was Armani yeah. Exchange. Uh, my, I wore it a lot. Yeah. The idea of it was to make a, a jeans line and, and rather than call it Armani Jeans, call it AX Armani Exchange, which was kind of modeled after a, a military PX. During the war, they had a PX where the, all the soldiers came and got their basic T-shirts and khaki pants. And that's what he wanted. He wanted real quality iconic items that really matched up totally different than what he was known for, which is couture sort of gowns and this and that. But 
it was probably working with him, and he was such a gentleman and such a talent. It was just mesmerizing to, because we worked very closely together for about four years, it was just developing this thing, uh, AX Harmonic Exchange, and it was probably the zenith of my career working for him. Uh, yeah, it's was, amazing. I mean, two iconic designers, you know, from the 80s, they're just, they were so big. They're still so big. Still They're so still big. one of my favorite designers. And they just relaunched AX and got a note from one of the people I work with there that thanking me and the, the, the work that I did. And they relaunched it in Milan, which I'd love to go over and see it because it means so much to me. I spent so much time with it. Mm -hmm. So, And then after that, you went to, what happened after? We, we sold, Street. basically, Mr. Armani sold the AX business to an investor in Singapore. And basically, I took some time off. And the next business I got into was Coach Leather Goods, which I thought it was time to diversify out of apparel and get involved in. So it's a funny story. I, I got the job at Coach as president of Coach. And uh, the first day I showed up to work, they sent up, they said they needed a press release for the New York Times because the head coach had a new president. They sent up a PR girl to write the press release. And I'm sitting there interviewing with this PR girl, and she's asking me all these questions. And I was looking at my watch, and I said, you know, excuse me, but this is my first day at work. i gotta, <laughs> I got to get to work here. And uh, she said, okay, that'll be fine. I think I've got enough. And so she left, and about 15 seconds later, there was a knock on the door. And she, I looked up, and she was standing in the doorway. And she said, I do have one more question. And I said, yeah, well, and she said, marital status. And I said, single, no children. And that's Kelly, my wife. I that's so funny. <laughs> married the PR girl that wrote the, they said, I thought, that's an interesting question. So, Well, why was she asking it? <laughs> that's a, was she trying to ask you out? Yeah, uh, that's what I thought, and I ended up asking her out. So uh, the rest is history, and we're that's still so happily funny. married here in, in, in Montecito. So. Mm -hmm. But I did that for about five years, which was a lot of fun, and then I got involved in the shoe business with Reebok that they owned uh, called Rockport Shoes, and they owned Ralph Lauren. That's how I, they owned the license for Ralph Lauren footwear, which is uh, called Ralph and we kind of put the deal together where I'd run Rockport and Ralph Lauren footwear for... Was it a sneaker brand? No, basically we did sneakers, and that's the reason they wanted to sign up with Reebok because they wanted to be in the sneaker business. But it was uh, everything from high heel couture women's shoes to you know, men's penny loafers, and it was a big business, and it was kind of structured incorrectly and we put it back together and made it to real business and sold it back to Ralph Lauren and then Reebok was sold to Adidas and I basically at that point I was going to retire and I uh, had a very successful career and decided that maybe I'd had enough and took about a year off and then got a call from a friend of mine that I'd known to the industry for a while that was owned a company called Oxford Industries which they owned Tommy Bahama and they called me up and said, would you be interested in running Tommy Bahama and for me? And I said, I sure would like to take a look at it because it, it, it was early days of Tommy Bahama and they had some great successes, but they, they needed to hire somebody. The founders were looking to leave the business and they were looking for somebody to run it. And I, I, once I took a look at it, I thought, I can't let this go. i got to take this one. And it was a. Uh, I remember it. Uh, I remember the rise of Tommy Bahama. I yeah, it was so uh, funny that I would meet the the man behind the rise of Tommy <laughs> Bahama years later. No, that's kind of was the success of Tommy Bahama. Everybody that came close to it would realize that uh, it was a true lifestyle brand. People talk about lifestyle brands and. And everybody wants to be a lifestyle brand, but uh, say that it's a life. Name five of them on your on your thing, five fingers, or name five lifestyle brands. And it's hard to come up with. They're great brands, but they're not. Like, Ralph Lauren's a lifestyle brand. Tommy Bahama is a lifestyle brand. I mean, I don't know that you would say Gucci is a lifestyle brand. Uh, but, what? What lifestyle brands can you think of? I, mean, what, I can try to think of some, on, and I can't. I, I, basically. Uh, I know Tommy Bahama. Tommy sure. Bahama, Ralph Lauren, L.L. Bean, I think, is a lifestyle Gap. brand. 
that gap's not a lifestyle brand because what could Martha Stewart is a lifestyle brand. Yeah. Uh, Calvin Klein is not a lifestyle brand. It was a great brand, but mm -hmm. it wasn't a lifestyle brand. Lifestyle brands, in my opinion, are when basically people resonate with it and want to buy into that, everything that around it. We just, I'm still on the advisory board of Tommy Bahama, Oxford, and we just opened a, a resort in Palm Desert Spa and Resort, which and it's been overwhelmingly successful. But how many brands would have the ability to open up a hotel? Yeah, uh, I can see uh, that. Uh, in Palm Springs, they have it. You guys have a flagship store, don't you? In Palm Springs, there's yeah. a, a store, and in Palm Desert, there's already a store. So we had we had the uh, but these people want more. They just want more of Tommy Bahama. They can't get enough, and mm -hmm. it's a real. That's what makes a real lifestyle brand when people want more of what you do. Got and, it. Uh, and that uh, Tommy Bahama is, is, I think, the one that most, uh, there'll be studies done on Tommy Bahama, how, how it captured the minds and hearts of so many people. Yeah, I could see, you know, a beach cruiser, Tommy Bahama beach cruiser. Absolutely. Yeah, surfboards, I guess, or... We got in, when I was there, we got involved with the beach chair business. Mm -hmm. And even here in Montecito, when I go down to the beach, which is a couple of blocks from here, when Sam and I, uh, a teenager, we'd go down there, we'd do counting, we'd count and see how many, in fact, four to five to one were Tommy Bahama beach chairs mm -hmm. down there. Everybody loves those beach chairs. Or the sunglasses, the Tommy Bahama sunglasses. The Tommy yeah. Bahama sunglasses we did, yeah. And so... So anyway, when I decided basically I was going to retire for good, uh, I ran Tommy Bahama for about 10 years as a CEO and uh, basically decided to call it quits. And we'd always been, you know, we're, we're, it's Tommy Bahama, believe it or not, it's based in Seattle, which people don't really think about how can a brand like Tommy Bahama be based in Seattle. But we, we lived in Seattle. We'd come down once a month to Santa Barbara and to Montecito and fell in love with it down here and always said that when I retire, I'm going to move to you know, that, that area because it was so special. So we did. We left New York and left Seattle and came out here and thought, now I'm going to retire. And basically after about six months, I was so bored, I couldn't figure out what to do. And I Well, I mean, you've also lived in other places besides New York, Seattle. I lived Dallas, in Milan for Milan. five years, yeah. working for Giorgio Armani, and yeah. so, and I basically, of all the places I've been, I had never found a place as nice or nicer than Montecito. So it was an obvious choice. Mm -hmm. But I just got so bored. I mean, how many days can you go to the beach and read a book? Yeah. Uh, so you tried to retire, and then you failed to get at retiring. You can't failed retire. again. I failed You're not again. good at retiring. <laughs> no. And so just started working out of the garage and. It's right before COVID uh, really started in, and, and we, I had all these ideas about leather bags and found these saddle makers in, out in the valley here that basically weren't out of work because you know, there wasn't much of a business in saddle making. So well, why leather? I'd always just been interested in it. And when I was a coach, I was in the apparel piece of coach, which uh, I was always wanted to be in the leather piece of it. And I'd always had bags made whenever I traveled. I'd go to London or go to Milan. I'd have find a bag maker and make me a bag that just the way I wanted it with all the pockets that I wanted and this and that. So I was fascinated with it and something new. And I didn't want to get in the apparel business again. So leather goods was a uh, so I, I was also a brand person. So I wanted to name it something that and it was an interesting the guy that I think his name was the founder of uh, Rolex watches had a quote one day that said a brand name should be uh, less than five letters and be pronounced in any language in the world. And that's where he came up with Rolex. He just mm -hmm. came up. So I thought my grandfather's name was Homer. So I thought five letters or less and can be pronounced it. Because people who I thought would, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey from Homer or Homer Simpson or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. But it was a good name. So I named the, the brand, started developing product and putting together a label and a logo and graphics and this and that. So it was... Did the name inspire the 
the designs? Well, that's a good question, but uh, the answer is yes, because my grandfather was, Homer was a cripple. He fell out of a high chair when he was eight months old, and in Arkansas, in rural Arkansas, they didn't set his leg correctly, so I never remember him without crutches. He was on crutches his whole life, and when he needed a job, he got a job as a rural mail carrier, because he could sit in a horse and buggy and deliver the mail without getting off and walking, so, but he had to make his own bridles, and as a kid, I remember going to, uh, out in the back shed where he was uh, hammering out and making bridles for the for, for the horses. Mm-hmm. So in a way, but he never made bags, or but then he was never made a, a real business out of it. He would just do it for people in the neighborhood. And, Did was he a big influence in your life when you were younger? Oh, uh, absolutely, spend a lot of time with him? absolutely. And my father's name, Homer Jackson Jr. After him. Uh, so this, the name Homer is, you know, an important name and I, I think it's got some strength to it. And I'm, I'm amazed at how well it's transitioned. We've opened a little store down in, down in Coast Village Road here in Montecito. We're, it's uh, a cute little spot. It's, it's a great little, little spot. Little, yeah, yeah. Perfect little size. I love going in there. Yeah. It was, uh, it was a garage for 50 years. It was empty. And a friend of mine is, owns the building. And I said, what are you going to do with that? And he said, I don't know. And I said, let me take it and see what we can put together in there. And we put together a little store and it's, we have a lot of fun doing it. We had a tailgating party down there on Saturday and we had about 25 people I think that's so much fun. Are you still doing that every Saturday? Yeah, we're, we're going to start. This is the first one we did on Saturday, but we're going to start doing it on Saturday in the summer. So the winters are a little slower in mm-hmm. Montecito because it's the rainy season. We just came out of the rainy season, so we were celebrating summer and mm-hmm. uh, felt great. But we're happy. And I think people in Montecito are happy. We don't sell it online. We don't sell it on wholesale. To anybody. If you want to buy it, you got to buy it. In the store, and people in Montecito kind of like having their own brand. <laughs> they do. We're running an ad. And, well, Montecito is very special. Yeah, we're yeah, running so. an ad that uh, the bottom line says only available exclusively at 1129 Coast Village Road, which is kind of uh, people say, can you maintain a business that way? And I said, yeah, I never intended Homer to be a giant brand. That's not that I want to build another one. I want to have fun and create great products. And that's what Homer is about. Could you tell us about the craftsmanship? Who's making the leather goods? And First of all, when leather, you start with the leather itself. And uh, studying leather, 95% of the leather tanned in the world is chrome tanned, which is a harsh chemical that is in. And the, the other 5% is what's called vegetable tanned, which are tanned with oak tree bark from an oak tree or other trees and put in these vats in the ground and takes, you can tan a hide in about three or four days with chromium tan, but but oak bark tanning takes about a year. And so we are only using natural vegetable tan leathers. And then we found some, the saddle makers out in San Ynez and uh, a friend of mine uh, had a little leather shop here that his third generation saddle maker and he helped me kind of get involved and learn the business and learn how it's made and since then we've had a saddle maker in montana and we have a little shop down in los angeles that makes some products for us too so we've got five to six uh we have a studio up, up on hot springs road here which which you've got a maker and so we've got several different types of bags, but we've got six to seven people that are making them. And we do a lot of custom work with personalization. And we have a painting studio down in Long Beach where we paint the initials by hand on uh, the bag. So it's kind of special and you can get what you want. Yeah. So uh, regarding the bags, so how, how how often are you open at the store? We we uh, I didn't want to work too hard, uh-huh. even though I'm working pretty hard putting it all together. But uh, we open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. But in the summer, we'll probably look at that and see if there's uh, you know you get a lot of uh, the business has been interesting because you get a lot of people from the locals, obviously come by Coast Village Road. Coast Village Road is kind of the central artery for shopping in Montecito. But then the hotels, the Miramar Hotel, which opened about five years ago, bring a lot of people in. And the Four Seasons, which has been closed, it's going to open back up, I understand, in May, which will have more traffic. So we'll we'll see. We're about open by appointment. 
which we've had a pretty brisk. Uh, we have a phone number in the window, and people can call, and I'll meet them down there. It's, it's only five minutes from my house. So it's just kind of the business where we wanted to run, very personal. and Yeah. So from conception is and where you are right now, is it exactly as you envisioned exactly it? exactly the way we planned it. Uh, as a matter of fact, the business has been a little better, uh, the actual volume. that We just finished the first year a couple months ago, and the business, uh, I, as much as it's, it's not a hobby, it's a business. So I wanted to have a business plan, and we exceeded the plan the first year, and we have a modest plan for this year, and I think we'll exceed that. So as long as we're not losing any money, and we're not going to make a whole lot of money, but mm-hmm. to have something that we can obviously... And if it does grow, and if it, uh, like I was talking to you about the lifestyle business, Homer's not a, a lifestyle brand right now, but it's a good brand, uh, a great brand. I think it can be a great brand. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, Where would you like to see it grow if you, um, you know, envision the future? What You know, since we put it together, had saddle makers make it by hand, I mean, the obvious brand that you would look to to aspire to is Hermes, which is a French luxury brand, which uh, sometimes I struggle with you know, looking at uh, Hermes, whether Hermes is a lifestyle brand or not, which it's a great brand, maybe one of the best brands in the world, in my opinion, that, uh, since I've been in this business mm-hmm. and what they do. But um, they continue to add product that please people and make, make people happy. And I think if we could just, if we we're, we're, have a limited amount of product style-wise, I don't want to get over-styled, but just make sure that the products that we have match up to the quality. We, the idea was with Homer was to make it as the best we could make it and uh, make it look American and uh, not make it. America had saddle makers, you know, all these great brands like Hermes was uh, a saddle maker to the rich people. Gucci was a saddle maker. Uh, and so you know, America had great saddle maker. Mark Cross was one of the probably the best example of an American saddle maker, but it doesn't exist anymore. So if we can make the best leather goods that are made in America, that's the. Uh, there is a Western sensibility to your brand, right? Kind of a coastal yeah. Western. Yeah. Is that uh, the uh, yeah. image that you're working towards? Yeah. I mean, if, if, if it's hard not to be in California and so in Central California where we are, and you go out to the valley, San Inez, and you had to, we set up at the polo field this year. We set up a store there. And it's, it's hard not, if you draw on inspiration. Uh, being here, that's the inspiration you get. And I think that look also resonates across the rest of the United States. Uh, you know, as long as we do and execute the, the brand message of quality and uh, simplicity and the stitching and the detail of the... I've got over in the studio over next door an Hermes saddle, which I constantly look at the stitches and the detail on some of the way that they put together... But, you know, they they do it a certain way in France, and we do it a certain way in America. And uh, I think our products look American, which is what I what mm-hmm. we want to strive for. But you're right; it does have a we call it a horsey sort of look to it. Yeah, you you mentioned that you spent a lot of time at the Miramar and the Biltmore is opening up. Are you planning on having some of your products at those hotels? The the, the, the Miramar has, has decided to put more shopping uh, in their in their facility. They had a couple of shops when they opened, but now they've added a new, having getting ready to open a new section. With uh, it'd be interesting if if we did do wholesale or did do some product, that would be a, a good place. There was a hotel that's opened up out in uh, the San and Maddie's uh, Tavern. Yeah, Maddie's yeah. Tavern, mm-hmm. which has expressed some interest in having some wine carriers there, which that's a quality uh, place, and it's a beautiful job what they've done out mm-hmm. there. So we'll, we've got a lot of work to do just to getting our business uh, the way we want it today without the extra uh, production that we would need for those kind of operations. But if we did it, that would be the actual place to do, uh, do the wholesale business to those resorts. Mm-hmm. Are you the only designer, or do you have other people helping you with some of these designs? Well, everybody's a designer. Everybody's got input. My wife uh, Uh and people come in when they hear that you can do custom. Everybody wants to design their own bag. And and we do custom, but 
Yeah. You know, I just showed you a prototype too. Yeah. When I walked into it, I'm like, you got to make this. Yeah, everybody, you know, when you give people an opportunity to be a designer, they'll design. But uh, right now, I'm the only one that's putting the products together. And you got a, a proto maker that makes the protos that is very good. And I, I was thinking about a bag this morning, actually, when I, I tried to do a walk every morning and clear my head. And I was thinking about a, people have come in over the weekend and the most uh, item that they're asking for is a makeup kit, you know, like a little kit bag, mm -hmm. a leather kit bag, which would be a, a, a natural item for Homer. Which, uh, But if we do something like that, we want to make sure that we don't just do an average everybody's kit bag. Uh, mm -hmm. Men's call them, men call them dop kits, women call them makeup bags. You know, but so I've got an idea for one. I have an old bag from the Civil War that I bought down in Los Angeles at an antique store, which kind of looks like the starting point for a great kit bag. So we'll see. That's, that's how it kind of starts is working from antiques and samples and then making it put the homer kind of finish on it that the guys we work with we say we got to homer it up a little more mm -hmm. right because you want it to be uh, all the products in the store that kind of have a, the same dna to them as uh and that's important so you know, we'll, we'll add products as necessary how do you feel about this because you want to make heirloom quality products but it seems like fashion lately has been going in the opposite direction because mm -hmm. of costs. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you see this type of product growing? Uh, do you think there's a big future for quality products? Yeah, I do. I do think that there's always. When I was working at Neiman Marcus, at the, mm -hmm. I mentioned the executive training program. Mr. Stanley wrote a book that was required reading for us. It was called "The Quest for the Best." Mm -hmm. And in his book, basically, he was, if you search for the best, and he said, there's always a market for the best. And I do, I still do believe that. However, what you say is true. Uh, I had a friend of mine that I did a lot of work with at Tommy Bahama in Asia. He came through town a couple months ago, and he kind of asked the same question. He said, you know, why don't you try making some of this product in China? And he said, just give me one of your bags, and I'll show you what we can do. Mm -hmm. And a couple of weeks later, a box arrived and it had a, a copy of my bag, a Homer bag, which made in China. Sure enough, it was absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, uh, but for some reason, you put the two down, you could see the difference. And I mean, you could say in a lot of ways, the one made in China was actually better sewn than the one sewn here, but it, it, we prefer the one with the rougher, more American looking. Uh, the other one was too refined. And so clearly, you know, you can make great products around the world and people chase. I've spent half my career chasing price around the world. We were at Chaps, uh, you know, we were making goods and, and even Ralph Lauren, we were making sneakers in China and I've been around the world many times. I said I didn't want to chase price, and I can make exactly the product here that looks the way we want to make it look American mm -hmm. and look like Homer without having to chase. Have you thought about doing limited release products? So they could yeah. Become a, yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, signed and numbered, mm -hmm. limited, limited quantities. Do you have that right now? Not yet, but we're working on it. We just did a summer tote bag uh, that uh, all canvas which we did actually make it in China because that kind of product is suitable. It doesn't have any leather on it. Mm -hmm. And we started selling them, and the people are seeing them walking around town and coming back and wanting them. So we have a limited quantity, and then we'll do another. It's funny. We started doing this about three weeks ago, and there was an article in the New York Times Sunday about a— uh, tote bag, a canvas tote bag they're selling at Trader Joe's for $2. Yeah. And my, well, my friend has one. It just yeah, got all different it's basically it different. holds a, it's a smaller tote bag, holds a sandwich and something, but you can't mm -hmm. get them. Now everybody wants them. Uh, everybody's clamoring. The guy was running the article was about he went to seven Trader Joe's before he got one. Yeah, no, it's going on. That's what's happening. I, I can't find the one I want. I just gave one away. I wanted another one to go on. <laughs> 
Oh, you, you've had one. Well, not yours. Not the Trader no, Joe's ones, but yeah. the Erewhon ones. I wanted to go get another one. They're gone. Yeah, we, I think we made 40 of them. And we sold quite a few this weekend. And I gave a couple away to a couple of very good customers. Maybe you'll be lucky enough to get one. I know. I'm thinking, how often do I have to stop by to get the new design <laughs> so I don't miss out? No. How often do you do? How often do you change your designs, or do you have new products? Well, this is the first time we've done it, so uh, I'm just working on a new one now. But the turnaround on on those bags are about eight weeks, mm-hmm. so I, I'll probably do one for holiday. We got this one for spring, and probably do one for holiday. It'd look a little more bright. Are you? Do we need to get on an email list so we know about these things that are coming up? Do you have an email? We list? don't have an email. We're on Instagram. That. Uh, because we don't sell online, so uh, but we we do have a, a, a email address, but we haven't really pursued it too much. So but, you'll announce potential new products on Instagram. Is that where we find out about them? Yes. And what's your Instagram account? Is Homer Maker. Okay, got it. Two one word Homer Maker, mm-hmm. and we put the uh, this weekend the tailgating party on, and we got a lot of people, a lot of people following. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many followers. I'm kind of new to this Instagram game, uh, mm-hmm. but uh, it's kind of fun to watch. And so how do people find Homer? What's the address? And also, do you market? Do you market Homer anywhere? We were doing ads in the Montecito Journal, the RIV magazine. And the, I find that since we're the only place you can buy it is Montecito, you might as well advertise truthfully in Montecito. So, Have you thought about any larger publications like Vogue? Uh, I would love to, but that that's expensive. Yeah. Uh, but the real that the Montecito Journal does twice a year is basically is, uh, is national distribution on that. So mm-hmm. they're trying to do East Coast and West Coast. That's the reason we're advertising there. But other than that, you can go to Homer Maker on the Instagram Instagram account and uh, mm-hmm. you find us there. And that has your address and phone number and yeah. all. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sounds yeah, good. Yeah. Now, if you had any advice for anybody else who wanted to uh, start a brand, what would you tell them? You know, just uh, anybody that's got a passion and a belief in some product that they believe in and they believe that their product is superior to what's in the market. I mean, you always read about online when I look at a brand, it'll say the story, our story, and about, and it's always about somebody that had an idea for something that didn't exist. and. Uh, I'd say follow your dream, but it's it's not easy to start out with expectations that are realistic. Mm-hmm. That not that for all the great brands out there that we used to have a saying at Tommy Bahama, crawl, walk, run. And uh, I still believe in that. I mean, we're still crawling. And someday we might walk and then someday we might run. But it'll feel right when it starts to happen. It, you can't. A lot of people spend a lot of money and start thinking they run from the day one, and it doesn't work that way. You uh, need to have foundation in the brand. And uh, so we're still working on the foundation at Homer and make sure we get it right, make sure we communicate the message that's the right message for them. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to try to get one of your tote bags. Oh, yeah. Uh, so maybe, I'm going to, like, maybe let's I'll go save, over the store after this. <laughs> maybe I'll save one for you. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. And Thank it's you. It's really great Thank talking you, to you. Kathy. It's very nice to... Thank Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you once again for listening. Make sure to stop by Homer at 1129 Coast Village Road to see his beautiful styles and follow him at Homer Maker on Instagram. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode. And if so, please help us by sharing it with your friends and family and rating it with five stars. You can also follow or reach me on Instagram at Living in Santa Barbara. And stay tuned for the next episode where I'll connect you once again with the incredible people that make Santa Barbara a wonderful community.